What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Einstein Bagels, Quest Nutrition, many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Uh, Our sponsor today is Rise25.com, which helps service professionals, doctors, lawyers, accountants, dentists, coaches, anyone working clients with one-on-one, stop trading Time for dollars, shift more from one-on-one client work to -to one-to-many client work um, so that they can leverage their time. And you can go to rise25.com, learn more. There's a, you can download a free dream product letter, which helps basically plan your business on one sheet of paper that helps you see the gaps in untapped revenue potential. Companies like Disney, Apple, the sporting industries, they all use versions of the product letter. I am really excited to jump into this. Today, I have a force of nature. The force of nature is Adrian Richardson. And first of all, you don't mess with a hockey mom from New Jersey. That's one. And I like to brag about Adrian that she is one of the top marketing experts around. And Adrian, I don't like to pigeonhole you to even, even though your site says you know, you're a Facebook ad expert, um, you know, because you're so sharp when it comes to the messaging, the copywriting, the funnels, direct response marketing. There's so much more that goes into a campaign that you run for people that I think saying Facebook ads doesn't do it justice for you. So my tagline for you would be, hi, I'm Adrian. I drive cold traffic, people who don't know you, into an automated webinar where you don't have to show up to do it and have it spit out millions of dollars on the other side. How are you? (laughs) So, um, of course, you you work with top people of systems in place to do that, you know, that, you know, it's not just, Put a Facebook ad, a web, auto in a webinar. There's a lot more complicated pieces that go into that. Mm-hmm. And you spent tens of millions of dollars on Facebook. So you've been in the trenches. You know it works. What doesn't? And you have a laundry list of amazing clients. Russ Rafino, University of California, and many more. And the last thing I'll say before I let you actually talk is or I could just keep saying good things about you, um, <laughs> that you may be the only ad expert who can deliver a baby in the back of a moving vehicle. So, Adrian, thank you. I'm honored to have you. Thank you so much, Jeremy. I'm honored myself to be here with you. So, let's start with that. Why are you delivering babies? <laughs> well, back in the day, I was a paramedic in the Air Force, and uh, we, when you're in, when you're a paramedic in the Air Force, sometimes you're on the ambulance, sometimes you're in the emergency room. You're kind of all over the place. So. I've spent, uh, after I got out of the military, I was also a paramedic in Atlantic City. So delivering babies in the back of an ambulance actually happened after I got out of the military ah. and was working as a paramedic in Atlantic City because uh, lots of crazy things happen in so Atlantic City. So craziest baby <laughs> delivery story? Um, craziest baby delivery story is, there, well, there's a lot of people in South Jersey that don't speak English. Um, we have a high immigrant um ratio of people or whatever in South Jersey. So it's very difficult to deliver a baby when you can't communicate with the person giving birth. (laughs) So you're kind of just trying to communicate with through the people that are there and making hand signals or whatever. And, and a lot of people, (laughs) what what else do you need? Yeah. (laughs) So I could say that my most challenging one was probably working with a woman that I could not speak her language and uh, trying to communicate what's happening, what we're going to do to her or, you know, where we're going to move her, all of those things. And and so getting them quickly into an ambulance and trying to just take care of things without communicating with them can be a challenge. (laughs) We'll get into, I mean, you have the cutting edge strategies on Facebook and they kind of apply widely and just direct response. But um, I, you know, some of your mindset and your work ethic and what you have going on stems from earlier on, right? And I don't know if you're allowed to tell this story. This is one thing we talked off. Are you tell, allowed to tell the latrine queen story or not? Sure, if you have okay. time for it. Okay, <laughs> latrine queen. I, this is one of my favorite thing stories about you for some reason. I don't know why. Um, so I want to share it with the world. So... Okay, I'll, I'll give kind of the condensed version so that people aren't here all day long listening to me. But 
when you join the military and you head off to basic training, uh, there are assignments that each person within your squadron are given, you know, job assignments, uh, chores that they're in charge of. And the first day that I arrived, our drill sergeant says, you know, who here? Now, I was 17 years old. Okay, I was barely 17 years old. I turned 17 in May. I went into the military in October. Okay. Yeah. So I was you a graduated bit, early from high school. And went, I skipped yeah. a year of high school yeah. and went straight into the military. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I was just a baby and the drill, <laughs> the drill sergeant says, you know, who here can be a B and not care if anybody likes them and blah, 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 blah. blah. And so I raised my hand. I'm like, me, you know, now I'm the youngest person there. Okay. There's I would everybody have there. never raise my hand in a situation like that. <laughs> everybody there was uh, at least, you know, 20, 22, 25, older, whatever. I was 17 years old. So I was like, I can do that. Uh, I was pretty feisty, crazy 17 year old. Um, and so they made me the dorm chief. And now the dorm chief is in charge of all of the girls. There's about 40 of us. Um, when the dorm, when the drill sergeant goes home for the night to his family, the dorm chief is in charge of everybody. And so they made me the dorm chief. I was in charge. And, uh, by, I think it was day two, uh, we had to run our two mile run. Now, I didn't plan to leave for the military as fast as I did, so I didn't really prepare. I had I wasn't running at all, so I had to run two miles, and I couldn't I couldn't run. So I pretty much walk run walk run. You know how you do that walk run. You know you're like dying, so you stop running. And, you're, and my drill sergeant was just screaming in my face like, "You're the leader here. You're the dorm chief. You can't even run. Like you better start running." And he's screaming at me, and um, I couldn't I couldn't do it. So he fired me. He said, you're fired. You, you know, you're being a poor leader. You, if you can't even run, what kind of example are you giving to people? And so he knocked me down to the, um, oh gosh, now I'm like drawing a total blank element leader. So an element leader would be like vice president, right? So like dorm chief's president, element leader is like vice president. And now you're just in charge of the 11 girls that sleep in your row. Okay, so we have a row of beds, I'm at the head, and so now I'm in charge of those girls. So now I'm not in charge of all of them, I'm just in charge of the, the group. And um, a few days later, while everybody's doing their chores, I was writing letters to my boyfriend. And some of the girls got mad, and they told on me. <laughs> so I got fired as the element leader, because again, I was being a very poor example of a leader. While everybody else was doing their chores, I was just writing letters to my boyfriend. And so I got fired as the element leader and I became the um, shoe aligner. And the shoe Sounds aligner. also horrible. Yeah. <laughs> so there's a bed aligner and a shoe aligner. The bed aligner has to make sure that all of the bunk beds are lined up so perfectly that when the, the um, drill sergeant comes in and inspects us, he can stand at the front of the row and look down and only see one bed. So they have to be 12 beds, 10 beds, or would it have to be perfectly lined up? And I was the shoe aligner. So the shoe aligner has to make sure that the front toes of everybody's shoes mm. that you line up underneath your bed, the front toe of every shoe has to perfectly line up. And it has to line up with the edge of the bed. And so one day, you know, a week later or so, we're getting inspected and the drill sergeant calls in the bed, the bed aligner and is screaming and yelling at her because, you know, she didn't do a good enough job and he tells her to fix it. Well, when she fixes her bed, she messes up my shoes. So now I get yelled at. Like I'm brought in there and I'm being screamed at because I didn't do my job. And I'm like, look, it's not my fault. It's her fault. The bed aligner, you know, she messed up my shoes. And so because I didn't take responsibility for my own problem and I blamed someone else, I got fired from being the shoe aligner <laughs> to I was then the fire monitor. And the fire monitor gets to take out the trash every night. And next to the trash can is a the mailbox now this was a long time ago okay this was in 1995 and so everybody still wrote letters to their family and mailed them home and that was the only way you could communicate with your family in basic training and the fire monitor's job was to collect everybody's letters and when you took the trash out you mailed their letters home and so one night one of the girls that the, the bed aligner who had gotten me in trouble wanted me to mail a letter home for her and I was like, heck no, I'm not mailing your letter. Like, you got me fired, and that's why I'm the fire monitor now. So I'm not mailing your letter. You can mail it yourself. And she told on me, and I got fired from being the fire monitor to being the latrine queen. And the latrine queen is in charge of cleaning all the toilets, and oh which, is, which is the lowest job you could possibly have in basic training. So in a matter of weeks, I went from being in charge, being the leader, 
to being the lowest man on the totem pole and having the worst job possible. But we had like 10 toilets and I made all of the girls only use two toilets so that I only had to ever clean two toilets. I wouldn't let them use the other toilets. So I did make my job a little easier. <laughs> so did you always want to be in the, the military? Because you went at such a young age. Um, no. Well, both, so both my parents were in the military. Mm. I always, all my friends were military brats. I, all, that's all I've ever known is the military my whole yeah. life. Um, I didn't know that I, I didn't plan to go into the military, but what I did plan to do was get out of my mother's house as fast as possible and get on my own. I've always been extremely independent and wanted to do things my way. <laughs> so I saw the military as a way to get out of the house with, and being completely independent. I didn't want to go to college or get a job where I'd still need to live at home. I wanted mm. I wanted to be on my own and make my own decisions. So my mom thought it was really hilarious that I thought that leaving her house and going into the military would give me more freedom. Uh, <laughs> so the joke was on me. <laughs> what was the biggest thing that looking back that you, you know, at the time, maybe it wasn't the most pleasurable experience, but looking back, what was a valuable lesson you got that you're, you're happy you went through that at the time? Well, I mean, I went into the military as a 17 year old, know it all with an attitude with, you know, just, did whatever I wanted to do. And I learned incredible lessons that I still use in my life today. And number one was the work ethic that I learned in the military. Mm -hmm. um, basic training being a huge part of that. I mean, there's so, there's not, we didn't even scratch the surface on the things that <laughs> I learned yeah. while I was there. Um, and I've carried that with me my entire life was always doing the very best job you can possibly do and doing it with incredible detail. Uh, mm -hmm. And so my work ethic was formed there. And, and even leadership um, type things, taking responsibility for your own actions. Uh, that was a huge lesson for me in the military. You don't blame others. Yeah. Um, you take, there's a wonderful book out called Extreme Ownership by some Navy SEALs. Yeah, and, I saw And that. I love that book. Uh, and that's what the military teaches is, you know, you take ownership, you take responsibility. And, and so yeah. that has served me well in life as well. Yeah, at the time, that's, you know, that, uh, that ownership piece is huge. And that's what I find very successful people always take ownership. Even if it feels like 99% of the other person's fault, they still take a piece of ownership of that yeah. whole, that whole process. And so what about discipline? Obviously you learn discipline from that. How does that translate into, you know, I know you have two kids. Mm -hmm. How does that translate into raising kids is not easy. Um, <laughs> how do you translate into raising kids, the discipline with the kids? Um, I can tell you that it, it's difficult to do. Um, I'm. Do you make I'm them like always... scrub the toilets? Like, what's the discipline? No, 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 oh, no, no. I'm no. just kidding. You're so... you're demoted to latrine <laughs> prince or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I can say that I'm constantly trying to teach my children that the lessons I'm trying to point out to them now, although they think that they are silly, are preparing them for adulthood. Yeah. Like and what? I try to. So, for instance, my son has a project due in Spanish class tomorrow. And, you know, he waited 30 days to get it done. He had plenty of time. And at the last minute, oh, I have a project due in a couple of days, you know. And my son plays hockey six days a week. So, right. if we have a project due, we need to plan our time properly. And so, I had a talk with him. And I said, you know, you think that this Spanish project you were given is just dumb and it's unimportant. I said, but it's teaching you how to meet deadlines and how to manage mm. your time. Because yeah. when you're a grown up, if your boss gives you an assignment and you can't meet that deadline and you drop the ball and they lose a client, guess what? You lose your job. Right. So I'm always trying to kind of bringing in the bigger them. picture, even though the yeah. thing, the, the task itself is stupid. Maybe yeah. you even think that too, right? <laughs> and but there's a greater lesson there. Right. And so I'm always yeah. trying to show them how what they're learning right now as a child is disciplining them yeah. and preparing them for adulthood. And I always tell them the purpose of being a child is to prepare you to be an adult. <laughs> yeah. So I'm always trying to relate things. And, and, you know, they don't always accept it 100 percent perfectly and go, oh, mom, that makes great sense. You're right. Like I'm, I say the same things all the time. So it's not like I've got this magic parenting yeah. miracle and my children are, you know, perfect listeners. They're not. Um, but I but I try really hard to always and, and about teaching them about taking ownership as well. You know, it's that's the thing. My son is really good at finding someone else to blame when he couldn't get his homework done mm. or when he forgot something. Right. And so I'm always, always, always trying to point out to them 
what our responsibility yeah. is in that situation. Yeah. What are the same things you repeat over and over? I'm curious, you know, because I think of, you know, one of your clients is University of California, right? So <laughs> I always think of John Wooden, the famous UCLA basketball coach. There's a small book called Wooden, and it's just his, the things he would repeat over and over to his players that became this, this methodology. So I'm curious what you repeat hmm. over and over. Um, I can say uh one of the things I always say most recently, because I don't know why, but my kids are always start saying when someone says something to them that mean that's mean, they're saying, oh, I'm offended. I don't know where that's coming from, but I tell them at least once a week that being offended is a choice, hmm. that uh, you don't have to be offended. You're choosing to be offended. Yeah. And, and so I probably say all the time uh, being offended is a choice. Um, I always tell them that if you put your stuff exactly where it goes, you can always find it. Uh, because my kids tend to leave their stuff all over the place. And that was also something from the military, just the incredible, everything has a spot. It goes in the spot exactly as it is. And guess what? Every time you go looking for it, it's there. Uh, so I'm always telling them if you put your stuff where it goes, it will always be there. (laughs) Um, and then also I um, tell them that, you know, um, being kind is a choice. That's another thing too that I that I'm always trying to teach my children is about being kind to others. Um, and then last but not least, I'd always I also tell them that they should not look for a feeling of importance to come from other people hmm. because people will always let you down. Hmm. Um, and that happens. My son's in middle school right now, and middle school is really hard. Uh, and they're looking for you know approval from their peers and what do people think of me. Right. And I spent a lot of time in my life worrying about what people would think of me. um, I feel like a lot of us do. I mean, it's very common. Yeah. Yeah. And I spent a lot of time not trying not to be who I am because I have a more direct personality and I was always told that that was a bad thing. And Mm. so for my children, I don't want them to look for approval from others or for others to be able to tell them who they are. Yeah. So I'm always trying to. Yeah. You don't want them to soften who they actually are. Because yeah. of worried about what other people will think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so those are probably things I say quite often. I don't think they've sunk in yet. <laughs> I feel like a broken record. Yeah. But I'm going to keep saying it because I believe that someday that will make a difference and they'll look back on it and they'll say, well, I do this or I think this way because my mom taught me that. Yeah. And then for people listening to this and not watching the video, there's a really cool um, saying behind you. Do you want to um, talk about the meaning of that? Yeah. Or so read it, it says. For a second. Yeah. It says, be strong when you are weak, brave when you are scared, and humble when you are victorious. Um, And so I always, those are uh, integral pieces of my life as well. I always tell my kids, um, I don't ever tell them not to be scared. I just tell them to do it scared. Mm. Do it anyways. I, I don't ever say, you shouldn't be afraid or there's nothing to be afraid of. I say, it's okay. It's okay if you feel scared, but you do it anyways. And so the, you know, being brave when you're scared, that's the whole push through your fear. And um, I really, truly believe in being humble, um, especially my son plays hockey and, you know, they're, you know, he wants to cheer and go crazy when he's scoring, but I'm always trying to encourage him to also recognize his teammates and tell them what a great job they've done and, and not be so um, self-centered and be more others mm-hmm. centered. Where does that come from? Does that come from somewhere or is that just you put it together from different sources um a lot of it comes from my faith Mm -hmm. um i'm a christian and that's a lot of what we teach is about being others centered and being kind and i mean just that that saying specifically behind you yeah so you did Um, you come up with that no i didn't come up with that i actually found it on a website somewhere and it rang so true to what i am always teaching right um and uh it just seemed like the good place to put it yeah yeah (laughs) no i love it i love that you have that behind you yeah you know in one part of your trajectory adrian is you were you know working with these big companies in pr nascar super all these companies and then you got laid off Mm -hmm. so what was your mindset what were you thinking then at that time because you were you pregnant at the time or yeah Mm -hmm. so you're pregnant and you get laid off so yeah what were so, you thinking when that happened? Yeah. Yeah. I, I worked for a PR and advertising agency in Philadelphia and uh, after college and after I got out of the military, a long way after that. Yeah. And um, 
I loved working there. It was a great job. It was something I always hoped for after college. Um, but when I decided to start a family, I was brought into a meeting about halfway through my pregnancy and was told that I was no longer needed. Mm. And they didn't say it was because yeah. of my pregnancy so, at all. So, like nowadays, that's was there that's laws illegal. in place? Yeah, it's illegal now. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I don't know what they what they did was illegal, but they didn't say it was because I was pregnant. They tried to say, well, we don't have enough work for you. But the reputation at that company was mm. that they didn't want anybody there who had a family. So everybody who worked there was single or mm. were like older, and their kids were off in college. Uh, so it's kind of what they were known for. And people who had children, they just never came back. Mm. Uh, and so I was laid off. And at the time, you know, when you're a woman and you are pregnant and you lose your job, you know that nobody else is going to hire you right now. I would hire you. but this, <laughs> no. You know, nobody's going to say, oh, yeah, come work for me for about four or five months. And right when you get in the groove of things <laughs> so and you're, you're trained, right. you'll leave. Perfect. So, yeah, you know. Right. So I knew that That's I couldn't get a job. I was collecting unemployment. And in the state of New Jersey, um, when you collect unemployment, you're required to go to like classes and stuff. And one of the um, meetings I was at said, if you have an idea to start your own business, um, submit your idea. And, you know, if it's accepted, the state will pay for you to um, go to a class to learn how to start a business. That's cool. Yeah. Um, and so when I lost my job, um, I was obviously it was devastating. And you're thinking like, holy crap, I'm about to have a baby and I just lost my job. Um, but at the same time, of course, it's easy to look back now and say that it was perfectly planned. And right. <laughs> um, so I took the class. I uh, was trying to think of an idea. I didn't really have an idea at the time, um, but it made me start thinking like, well, could I have an idea to start a business? And uh, like most people, good ideas come to me in the shower Right. And uh, so one day I, I said, well, maybe I'll start a mom's group. Like, I'm going to be a new mom. I don't know anything about being a mom. I want to meet other moms. And where I live in southern New Jersey, is it's very different than North Jersey. Okay, So we're very isolated, lots of farmland. There's nothing around me. I don't even have my own grocery store in our town. Like, really? <laughs> Yeah, no grocery store in our town. Uh, and so I thought, well, I'll start a mom's group. I'll connect with other moms and we can have meetups and stuff with the kids. And then a couple of days later, I thought about turning that into like a newsletter because my degree was in public relations. I do a lot of writing and editing and all of that. So I thought, well, I could do a newsletter. And then that idea a few days later turned into a magazine. I was like, I could start a parenting magazine. And <laughs> I like I the evolution know. of this. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't know anything about starting a magazine. I, like I said, I have lots of experience in writing and editing and in public relations, um, but not so much in publishing a magazine. And uh, my mom, I was sharing my idea with her, and she said, you could call it South Jersey Mom. And I was like, that's a great idea. So I launched my own parenting magazine called South Jersey Mom about nine months after my son was born. Wow. Oh. Yeah. And I think if I remember the first issue, um, you rolled out 10,000 copies and you had one paid advertiser. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so again, I wasn't very smart. Uh, I just wanted to go, go, go. And so I, yes, we printed 10,000 copies on a full color, glossy print magazine and rolled that out with one paying advertiser. So, you know, I paid for that, pr that magazine with my credit card. <laughs> but you grew it since then. I mean, you had mm -hmm. advertising sales over $250,000 annually. What was working to get advertising sales? I mean, you went from one and obviously over a period of time, you started getting more. Well, yeah. I mean, the the interesting thing, and I didn't realize I was doing this, it wasn't purposeful, um, was ever, so the, the magazine grew in popularity very quickly because of the content. And number one, I always put local kids and local moms on the cover of the magazine. Uh, I wrote an editor, a, a letter from the editor every month. And in most magazines, most of us never read the letter from the editor. Like you just flip through those pages. But for whatever reason, people would read mine. And I was very open and honest with people about my struggles with motherhood and the things I was dealing with. Um, and people really started, could relate to that. And yeah. I hired, you know, I paid moms to write articles on parenting mm -hmm. and all kinds of ideas. And so the content 
with, people loved it so much yeah. that it became an incredibly popular magazine. And, you know, the advertisers respond to that because, you know, it was hard in the beginning. We had to convince people to buy print, you know, to br buy um, ads in something that wasn't proven to have any readership yet <laughs> right? because it was a free magazine. Um, and how did you but get distribution? As, Where did, how did um, you... I paid, I paid a district, uh, there's like local companies you can pay to drive mm. around and they would drop off free copies in like every doctor's office, mm. you know, anywhere where there was a sitting place for people yeah. where moms would go. Um, I would have the copies dropped off there yeah. and because it was a free magazine, the, the businesses were totally fine with me dropping off a resource there for their people to look at when they were waiting in their waiting room. Um, and, and so it grew in such in popularity. And so advertising sales grew and grew because of that people, you know, the more people who are reading it, the more that are responding to yeah. their ads. And, um, like I said, eventually for a, a small local magazine, eventually we were printing 30,000 copies a month. That's great. It was a monthly magazine. And we had about 250,000 a year That's or so awesome. in ad sales from local businesses. <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, Talk about the, the letter for the editor, kind of, Adrian, because one thing that made that successful is, was the vulnerability, probably, that yeah. you were sharing. That vulnerability resonates. What was one that you remembered? At the time, maybe you didn't even know what you were doing, but um, what was one thing you remember really resonated with people as far as, as that goes? Because oftentimes we want to hold back our struggles in business and personal, and that's the same thing that will attract people to us. Well, there were two two things that I can remember uh, right off the top of my head. One is I struggled with postpartum depression. And postpartum depression is something that a lot of women hide and they don't like to talk about because it's a very shameful thing to have, or at least society shames us. Right. And so that was the whole reason I, one of the reasons I started the magazine too, because I had that and I wanted to connect with other moms and I wanted them to not feel so alone because I felt very alone when I had it. Right. And so... That was really what catapulted it. it was way I was, that's also the reason I was able to get tons of press to talk about the magazine and and my story um, because I was open and honest about yeah. that struggle. And at the time in the state of New Jersey, when I launched this, our governor's wife happened to have be a postpartum had mm. postpartum depression, and she launched this huge campaign statewide to help women with it. So that just so happened to coincidentally. Mm. Um, go along with that. So that was a big thing for us. And a lot of women would come to me and say, you know, thank you so much for talking mm. about this because, you know, I couldn't even tell my best friend that I was struggling with this. Right. I mean, it's hard enough to tell our best friend or, or mm -hmm. one person. So how were you able to muster the courage to <laughs> actually put it in public? Um, I just, I just felt like that's what I was supposed to do. Mm. I, I felt like I had this platform and I had this thing that I wanted to connect with other moms and it just, I just felt like it was my duty to do that. Um, and, and luckily I didn't get a lot of backlash from people. I didn't get a lot of hate mail from people. Everything that I did get from people was them thanking me yeah. for making them not feel so alone yeah. and like yeah. they were terrible people. Um, and then the other one that I wrote, I don't remember word for word, but basically a letter I started at, it out with like, this week I changed 531 diapers and I, you know, woke up 65 times in the middle of the night right. and I fed my child, you know, 285 bottles and da, 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 da. And I was like, and I'm exhausted, you know? Right. And it was just People about relate this. to that. Yeah. They related to that. <laughs> like, I have, yeah, I'm going to a depression thinking about those days. No, I'm just <laughs> They're hard, yeah. you know, they're, they're hard times when, when, because with moms, they kind of lose themselves during that times. So you're, you're spending all your time caring for someone else and you're completely kind of losing yourself along the way. Right. And it can be a hard transition, especially with the first baby. Yeah. Um, and, and that, so those are two things that really got a strong reaction from people where they were like, thank you so much yeah. for talking about this and making me feel like there's, I'm normal. There's not something wrong with me. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, thanks for sharing that. I think that's so <laughs> important, and um, I try and be aware of that that piece. Like, if there's something I'm holding back, why am I holding it back? You know, and other people are probably experiencing the same thing. Yep. Um, so you went on, you sold the magazine, mm -hmm. and you went on to figure what your next thing was, and you had a big epiphany when a client you were writing email for, mm -hmm. if you remember, landed yeah. a big... Talk, talk about that for a second. 
Um, I love this, this, the whole concept behind this. So, yeah. So I, um, when I, I sold the magazine, I took a couple years off and then I just started, decided to start my own marketing agency. And I started out by just reaching out to people who had been my clients when I had the magazine, you know, who needs help. I can do email marketing. I can write website copy. I just basically anything and everything that I knew how to do for my marketing advertising background. Mm -hmm. I kind of contacted all the people I knew and told them this is what I can do. And, um, one of the guy, one person responded to me and they own a painting company. Um, and he was like, Hey, I need some emails written. I have a huge email list and I need weekly emails written to these companies to try to get them to, you know, have us come out and do an estimate for them that he only did like commercial painting, commercial exterior painting. And, um, I was like, sure, I can do that. And he was like, well, how much, you know, do you want to get paid? And, you know, I'm thinking, wow, man, if I could get paid like 50 bucks an hour that I'd be rich, like <laughs> that would be amazing. And I'm like, oh, it'll probably take me about a half an hour to write an email. So I'm like $25 an email, you know, cause I'm thinking 50 bucks an hour takes me half an hour, it's $25. Right. So I said, um, I, you know, I could do it for $25 an email. So he's like, great. One email a week, I'll pay a hundred bucks a month. And I'm like, awesome. <laughs> And so I You're start like with sucker. No, I'm yeah, kidding. yeah. I'm like, ha, 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 I'm getting paid fifty dollars an hour. Okay, and uh, and so I start working with him, and I'm writing emails for him and stuff. And they're very easy emails to write. I mean, painting is painting, right? It's like <laughs> you either need it or you don't. Um, very easy emails to write. So I really thought that I was getting paid well to do this work. And one day he um, emails me, and he's like, "Hey, I just want to let you know." that the email you sent for me last week, um, a national bank um, contacted me from that email and they want me to paint all 100 locations of theirs all over the country, mm. you know, and that was a multi-million dollar deal for me. And I was like, that's awesome. I was so excited and proud of myself. I wrote this email that got him this multi-million dollar deal and I go tell my husband and he's like, cool, how much did you get paid to, to do that for him? And I go, $25. <laughs> and he's like, so you got paid $25 and he made millions. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> he, my husband's like, that's a problem. Right. And I was like, yeah, it is. Um, and that was really the first time that I ever considered being paid for the value of what I was producing right. versus how much time it took me to do it. Yeah. Such a different mindset. I had never mindset. thought about that. I had never thought. I mean, I've worked a job my entire life. You work X amount of hours, you make X amount of dollars. And so it was only natural for me to think in those terms when I started my company. Yeah. Um, and uh, that that was huge. That was a huge shift for me. You know, it's a self-worth thing, right? So how do you overcome that? Because it's really hard. Like, well, you could have... It would have been worth it if you wrote that one email for ten thousand dollars, right? For a hundred thousand dollars, it right. would have been worth it. Right. So, what shifted in you? How did you bring that to? Because we could talk a little about your pricing journey, right? Yeah. And that that's the the beginning stages. Yeah. Um, well, it wasn't. I can't say that it was this major epiphany that literally the next day I just like jacked my prices up like crazy. Um, <laughs> You're like thirty bucks. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I did raise them though. I raised, I think I raised them to fifty dollars an email <laughs> after that. So like you could afford me for the like next ten years. Like right. just, yeah. here was the crazy thing though, is I kept and I'll get I'll answer your other question in a yeah. minute, but uh, I kept gradually raising my prices on him because I knew I, I should be getting paid more for the work that I was doing for him. Because even though every email didn't land a multi million dollar contract, when you're painting commercial exterior buildings, that's a big ticket job, and um, I slowly started raising my prices. And when I got to the point where I wanted $100 an email, he said no. And mm. he wouldn't work with me anymore. Really? And that was um, big for me too, of learning the lesson of hiring, having someone appreciate the work that you do and seeing the value in the work that you do. So the, the, the change for me in the pricing structure had to do not just with my my internal feeling of what I thought my self-worth was, mm -hmm. but also in only working with people who valued, had right. saw value what I had to do too. It was yeah. both ways. That's a good point. Because you could have someone who, you know, I don't pay you, but you're worth way more than this. And they're on your side and they want, they have your best interest in heart at heart. 
and they want you to succeed. So they, they want to pay you more because of that. Right. Well, and they see the value in what you have to offer them in their business. And that was big for me too. So the first switch I made, I had to learn my own self-worth. It was very difficult for me in the beginning when I started selling my services because I personally didn't feel like the work that I did was yeah. worth a high ticket price. I didn't have the personal. Yeah. I think, I think for people like that came easy to you in a sense. And that's why that's also a piece of it. You are, you're talented and people are talented in a certain area and it comes easy to them. So they feel like, Oh, this took me like two minutes, mm -hmm. but to someone right. else that they could never do that. Yeah. It was like when I, I started doing Facebook ads, I, they were, they came so easy to me because of my marketing and advertising background. I could, you know, intertwine that. And it came so easy to me that when I first started out, I thought that my price was a good price. I was like, hey, I'm thrilled to be getting paid this. Right. And it wasn't until a few months later that I was actually doing Clients on Demand where I re met Russ Ruffino that he was try he was the one who convinced me of the value of the service I had to offer. And I was like, well, why would anybody, it's so easy to do. I was like, why would anybody pay somebody to do Facebook ads? It's so easy to do. And he was like, it's not easy to do. <laughs> right. And I was For like, you, it's so it's easy, easy to do. Right. And so we tend to diminish what we do when it's easy for us and we don't think mm -hmm. that it warrants a certain price because it's quote unquote easy. Uh, but it should come easy to us. We're, we're the experts in it, right? And that was a mindset shift that I had to make in realizing that I have a skill that is very valuable to others and that makes me valuable and I should charge as such. Yeah. So what, where do you start off? Where were you pricing before? We'll go um, BR, before Russ, and yeah. then after <laughs> Russ. <laughs> so before I did Clients on Demand, yeah. I was charging $500 a month to do people's Facebook ads. And if someone wanted to do like consulting with me, I was charging $75 an hour. And honestly, I'd never had a job in my life that paid me $75 an hour. Right. Uh, so I thought that I was, that was really, really well paid. <laughs> right. Um, and when I, um, uh, met Russ, he said, well, you need to change your price to $5,000 a month. And I literally laughed and I said, there's nobody on the face of this earth that would pay somebody $5,000 a month to do their ad. <laughs> on the face of this earth. That's there's the nobody. Statement. Yeah. Nobody. I said, nobody would do that. I go, why would you ever pay somebody $5,000 a month to do something that's so easy? And he, you know, he spent a lot of time and I couldn't make that jump. I couldn't make the jump from 500 a month to 5,000 a month. There yeah. was no way I didn't have the belief in, yeah. in my worth yet. And so I gradually increased it. You know, I went from 500 a month to 750 a month and then to a thousand a month. And then, you know, I gradually increased it. Same with my hourly rate. You know, I went from, you know, 75 an hour to 100 an hour to 125 an hour. Like yeah. I was making the tiniest increments yeah. that to the average person, if I pay you 150 an hour, 175 hour, the $25 difference is not going to make or break the deal. But in my mind, it was like, oh, this is a big deal. Uh, and so now four years later, uh, I don't even do one on one anymore. But when I did it, I was charging 750 an hour. Yeah. Um, so I what's that? Hunt. 10 time 10x from where I started yeah, 10X, yeah. <laughs> and people gladly paid me it because if they could get an hour with me I could make such a huge difference in the performance of their ads that they, they I, I couldn't I, I, I couldn't I didn't have enough spaces open on my calendar to keep doing it right. um, which was what was crazy and, and then eventually kept raising my prices to the same thing now my monthly rate is 10x what I started out at right and I'm and you know and guess what there's people out there <laughs> That, pay, that will pay it against what I actually believed in the beginning. Yeah. No, thanks for sharing that. Because I think even even now, right, if someone's like, you should be charging 50, that, that's, it just right. keeps pushing up um, our uncomfortability level, you know. Yeah. And um, I do believe that you have to earn the right to raise those prices, though. I don't sure. believe that you should just raise them to raise them. I think that you have to have. You the, get, get the, results, you know. You have to get results for yeah. people or you can't charge those kind of prices. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, people only stay as much as you're getting results anyway. So. Right. And that's why when I first started out, I shouldn't have started out at 5,000. It was okay for me to start out at 500 a month. I was yeah. new at doing it. I didn't have a lot of proven results yet. So it was okay to start out there. 
Yep. But I'm, I'm thankful that I realized my value and my worth when I did, because otherwise, who knows where, you know, where I would be at. Yeah. I want to talk a little bit about um, the ad component, mm -hmm. all right, and the sales funnel component. There's two different components. But um, if you want to talk a little bit about what's working, what hasn't worked for, I know you've worked with the University of California, Russ Rafino, many more. What have you, I mean, those are two very different, right? Yeah. There's a B2B and there's, I think the University of California was more integrative nutrition stuff. Yeah. Um, but on the, I guess from the, the Russ Rafino learnings, what have you learned that has been working and what have you learned that has not worked at all that you've kind of just stopped doing? Yeah. So, well, University of California and Russ Rafino, like you said, are two very different. And I'm happy to talk about both types of quote unquote funnels. Uh, with Russ, um, the, the biggest thing that works that everybody says won't work um, right. is a, a lot of people will say you can't run cold traffic to a webinar, you know, uh, and make sales from it. You've got to warm people up. You've got to nurture them. And, and we do that every day, all day, not just with us, but with the clients, the people and clients on demand. And uh, the biggest thing that I've learned there is, and that I, the mistake I pe think people make, and you talked about the sales funnels, was that people rely on Facebook to do way more of the work than it is intended to do. Yeah, I love when you and, talk about this. Everyone, <laughs> I have the pen yeah. in hand, so yeah, Pre <laughs> preach, Adrian. And and so they yeah. want Facebook. If if they're not getting the end result that they want out of their funnel, they always look to Facebook and say, "Well, Facebook, something's wrong with Facebook. Facebook's not doing this. Facebook's not. Yeah. Facebook's bringing me crappy leads." You we know, we need to send them to the military. Like, take accountability. It's yeah. not Facebook. <laughs> it's not it's, Facebook, it's, people. It's, it's, um, so you know, the, what you have to remember is that your funnel is like this customer journey, and each piece of your funnel has one job and your Facebook ad cannot do the job that your webinar is supposed to do or that your landing page is supposed to do. The, the Facebook ad has the job of getting people to click, yeah. not just any people. We want them to be as close to the right people as possible. They're never going to be an exact match. Like you can't say Facebook, I want you to show my ad to people who work in a nine to five job. They're miserable and they hate it and they wish they could leave and they're looking for an alternative source and they make a hundred thousand dollars a year and that, da, 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 you know, and they love yoga. Like you can do a lot with targeting <laughs> and you can get pretty close to that, right. but there's no targeting to target people in a nine to five job who are miserable, like, or people who are married and like are, are, are unhappy. There's no targeting for that. There are things you can target, but you're, so you want to get as close as you can with your targeting. And then your ad copy is also part of your targeting. Okay. So your ad copy has to also attract the right people. And that is where most people drop the ball in the ad is that they're not using their copy properly and thinking of it in terms of this is also a piece of targeting. And so the ad has one job. It's to get the people clicking that are at least kind of sort of as close as possible to who you're trying to reach yeah. as you can. Once they then go to the landing page, the landing page has the job of doing the converting. Ad doesn't convert. The landing page converts. The landing page carries the job of convincing these people that are complete strangers that have never heard of you before, don't know who you are, have, have no credibility or trust built up with you, to convince them to either spend an hour of their time watching a webinar with you or opting in and giving you their email address for some PDF or something. But the, the landing page has the job of convincing those people that they should give you access to them in some way, shape, or form. The ad doesn't have that job. The landing page has that job. Right. And then from there, um, if you're running traffic into a webinar, the webinar carries the burden of bringing the right people to you. That's where you further weed out and flesh out the wrong people and attract the right people. So if you're getting great results with your ad, hey, I'm getting people clicking, I'm getting people registering, but nobody's buying from me or nobody's booking a call with me, then right away it's very easy to see that your webinar is not doing its job of establishing you as an authority, of convincing people that they have a problem that you can fix, that you can fix it now, all of the things that the webinar is supposed to do. But what will happen is when people don't get calls booked or they don't make sales, they go, oh, these Facebook ads aren't working. <laughs> it happens 100% of the time. <laughs> 
And uh, and so then they tinker with their ads and they mess with their ads and then they still don't get the result and then they get more and more and more frustrated and then eventually they're like, oh, Facebook ads don't work. Yeah. What is, um, for people who aren't sure, uh, a normal percentage that people should be looking at? Like some people may not even know if what's good and bad from people clicking through to the landing page, people actually you know, putting their email in and then the webinar, you know, converting people. And, and so I'll give you a few numbers, but what I want yeah. people to pay attention to is that these numbers are not like written in stone because mm -hmm. it varies by industry and you can still be very successful even if you miss these numbers a little bit. Right. And, and so when it comes to a Facebook ad, uh, the metric you're looking for there is a 1% click through rate or higher. Facebook rewards you by charging you less per click if you hit a 1% click through rate or higher. And the higher you go with your click through rate, the lower your cost per click will come down. Right. And so that's the metric you're looking for there. On the landing page with ice cold traffic, we're looking for a minimum of 20% opt-in. Right now we have an ad running with Russ Rafino that's getting a 90% opt-in rate wow. on the landing page. I've never seen anything like that before. And no, I'm not sharing that secret right now. <laughs> <laughs> like you, you heard me, my mind uh, uh -huh. thinking. Like, oh, what is that? <laughs> is but it something it's, off the wall or is it? No. no, it's nothing off the wall. No, it's nothing crazy outlandish off the wall. Hmm. Um, but right now, maybe someday I'll, ca I'll share that case study, but not yeah. right now when we're in the middle of it. <laughs> right. But um, typically 20% from cold traffic uh, is, is the minimum we're aiming for. Uh, and then of the people who watch your webinar, if you're doing a webinar and you're looking to get people booking calls, you're really looking for about a minimum of 20% of people mm -hmm. to be booking a call. Mm -hmm. Okay. And this is now, for like a high ticket, higher ticket uh, price talking, point. Yeah, for high ticket sales. So Russ Rufino yeah. is a high ticket sales. So if you're doing something in the high ticket sales arena, that's what we're aiming for. And that's to get a call book. That's not yeah. if you're sending people to a sales page to buy. Right. Um, but the truth is, is that you could have a click through rate below 1% and you could have a landing page that's converting less than 20% and a webinar converting less than 20% and you could still make a killing and be very successful. Yeah. And, and so it depends on your industry. It depends on a lot of things, but those are sure. kind of the numbers. Yeah. Just so people have like an idea. Do you see a cutoff point where you should, in a webinar, you should send someone to a, uh, free strategy call as opposed to just selling directly on the webinar? Is there like uh, a rule of thumb tested. that you do? Yeah, we've done a lot of testing. Not a lot of testing, but we've done a little bit of testing with this. What we have found is usually if you're selling something for less than $3,000 or so, $2,000, $3,000, you can send them directly to a sales page. Mm -hmm. But you have to have done a whole lot of heavy lifting on convincing them that you, you the value is there and that they can trust you. Over that amount, typically somebody's going to want to talk to you on the phone before investing that amount. We did um, about a year ago test a webinar where we did, we told them on the webinar that it's $5,000 and send them right to a sales page. Uh, and what we did in conjunction with that is we offer, we, they could either go and buy right away or they could get on the phone with us. They had the mm -hmm. option. And we did have, I don't remember the exact numbers because it was so long ago, but I want to say maybe 10% of people went directly and bought, bought. Yeah. But the rest of them wanted, they just wanted yeah. to make sure it's before worth the they test, made that though. investment. Right. So it's we tested it. We like, hey, let's give it a shot. Let's Why see not? If 10% <laughs> right. just buy without a phone call, they don't need right. any more information. Right. So we did that at a $5,000 price point. Um, but because it was only 10% that bought, uh, we we abandoned that. And we, we did, went back to just doing a straight mm -hmm. call. Mm -hmm. And then what about, how does that change with University of California model? So the University of California is very, they operate very differently than your typical entrepreneur online marketer. You know, uh, most entrepreneurs, online marketers that are running funnels and such, they are looking to get results immediately. You know, I want to see, I'm making money right now. Right. Versus more corporate environments, they have, you know, a marketing plan for the year. They have a marketing budget for the year. They're looking to achieve a certain goal throughout the year. And they're much more patient. And, and so the strategy with University of California is they do all content marketing. So they, they put out a new blog post every three times a week. We run traffic to those blog posts all year long. So the, the whole purpose of them writing the blog posts and us running traffic is to just pixel as many people as we can. We do that year round. And then twice a year, uh, they do a webinar 
and we only run ads to people who we've pixeled. Yeah. So pixel, they just put a code on their, their website. Yes. So there's a cookie that goes on the website that remembers everybody who comes there. So we drive yeah. traffic to the website just for the for Facebook to be able to remember those people and build yeah. an audience out of them. Yeah. And then we run traffic to them. So two to three times a year, they'll do a live webinar. And we only run traffic to those people that we've cookied, that Facebook is remembering. And uh, they sell much lower tickets. So they sell an item, I think, for $97. They're trying to get people to become vegan. Um, and so they um, run a program teach you with you know um, recipes and things like that, a Facebook group. So it's like $97. Um, and they do that a couple times a year. And they make you know $100,000 or more each time they do it. Um, more more than that, honestly. Um, but they're very patient. They're yeah. like, we're going to pixel people all year long. And then we're going to do a couple webinars. We're going to make our money a couple times a year. And uh, it's a very different model. Yeah. The Talk about the, the Facebook ad piece. I mean, there's the image and there's the copy, right? So what are big mistakes people make with the image? Is there anything surprising you in the past or lately that for images that have worked or have not worked? What's funny with images is I feel like some people are just better at picking other pictures. You know, uh, a, a lot of people, clients that I work with uh, and clients on demand, you know, they pick their pictures and then they send them in and we kind of review them and give them feedback. Right. And it's shocking to me how many people just pick horrible pictures. <laughs> you know, it's you, you, the picture is the thing that gets people to stop scrolling. You know, it, that's what grabs their attention. And when you're, if you think about your own behavior on Facebook and you're scrolling through your phone, what would make you stop in your tracks? Right. You're busy, you're distracted. What's going to make you stop and right. read something? That picture is what's going to make you stop. And so most people do a really terrible job of picking pictures that are just boring or they're very typical. A lot of people will choose the picture of like the woman standing on the mountain with her arms in the air, you know, like that. Everybody runs those pictures. So they pick very typical common pictures or something that's just really not very attention grabbing. Yeah. And that's a very important element of your ad because if they don't stop scrolling, they're never going to read your ad. They're never going to click. So I don't think enough people put enough effort and time into choosing the right pictures. They need to be bright, colorful, grab people's attention. What's one that made you stop in your tracks lately? Or maybe is one you used or maybe one you saw that someone submitted? I'm curious, um, what's the elements? Because I love that question that you ask is, what would make you stop in your tracks, right? That's a, a big assessment. Anything lately come come to mind for you that um, in the well, past few anim months? animal pictures always do incredibly well. The most mm. shared pictures on social media are pictures of animals. Hmm. Uh, and so if why not take advantage of that? If people love looking at pictures of animals and they love sharing them, then I should use a picture of an animal. So we test a lot of pictures of animals. They typically do very well. Uh, Are there anything, particular animals that you... Um, dogs and cats do okay. best. Not sharks or something? Like, would a, would a violent picture of, like, a bear eating something or a shark? It depends that, on your audience. Okay. Yeah, I mean, because you want to keep it relevant at the same time. So you're not just, like, picking any old animal. Oh. But if you're talking about being a shark in business and you put a shark in the picture, well, then that would work. Right. If you were running ads to hunters and you were talking about catching bears and you had a picture of a bear, like, that would work. Yeah. Um, so you still want to make it relevant in some way. For it's sure. not just about shock and awe. <laughs> There's like a kitten <laughs> and then it goes over like, why are you talking to me about business concept? Yeah. Right. And so if I choose a dog or a cat, which I do a lot of, I try to make the action that the cat or the dog is doing in the picture relevant to the copy in the ad. Right. So am I talking about like I did a, a picture of a dog chasing something and in there I talked about chasing clients. Right. Right. So it, it's still relevant. You know what I'm saying? For sure. Um, you don't want to just put something random. Right. So image, anything else on images? So animals work, anything else um, as far as non-animal pictures? Um, you just... Lifestyle pictures are really good. Hmm. So lifestyle pictures, and what I mean by that is painting a picture of the outcome that the person's life or business is going to look like after you've solved their problem. So, and test positive and negative. So negative would be like, let's say I was running ads for moms and I help moms relieve stress and organize their lives better or something. 
I might choose one picture of a mom whose house is a hot mess and she looks like she hasn't showered in three weeks and she's like crying, <laughs> sobbing in the corner. And then I might pick a picture of a mom who's just really enjoying her family and she just looks so happy and vibrant and alive. Because That's that for is, 30 seconds. The other one is more realistic. No, I'm just right, <laughs> right. And so you can test both the positive and the negative of like one mm. is the situation you're in now right. and one is the what my life will be like after I solve this problem. Yeah. And almost always, I always test, but anyways, but almost always I'd say 90% of the time the positive image wins. Really? Yep. Wow. Yeah. I'm surprised. Yep. I know. What about copy? You know, there's there's always a debate, even with top copiers, more copy, less copy. Obviously, it's a, it's not more copy; it's boring copy. You know, but <laughs> but um, have you found anything working with that? Because I know images uh, makes them stop scrolling. It's almost okay. like like you were saying, the point of the Facebook is to, to get to get the click, but almost the image, the point of that is to get them to stop scrolling, and the yep. copy. It sounds to like get them it, to read, to get, to them... get the right people clicking. Yeah, so yeah, to make them want to click. Yeah. Well, the the thing with the copy is it's got to create some kind of emotional response and make them curious. Mm. Doesn't matter how short or how long it is. It needs to make people curious mm. and create some kind of response where they feel like you understand them. So yeah. I'm scrolling through my newsfeed. I see this picture like, oh, what's that? And then I read this copy. And as I'm reading it, I'm thinking, oh, my goodness, this person knows me better than I know myself. They know what I'm struggling with. And what's this? They have this thing I've never heard of before that can help me. I wonder what that is. And so you're creating this curiosity and making them want to click. Mm -hmm. And it's really important to use copy uh, in, a, in a language that your client would your prospect would talk about the problem. Uh, and so as you know, a chiropractor, we know that there's consultant speak. And then there's like the way the client talks about their back problem, right? Like, right. you can't talk about vertebrae, this and that, and they yeah. just come in and they're like, just make my back better. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and so when it comes to writing the right. copy, it isn't about impressing them with how much of an expert you are and how much you know, and, and using big words. It's about being they they need to feel understood. You need you need your reader to feel understood right. and like you know their problem better than they do. And you can only do that if you use language that speaks directly to them. Are there certain methods that you teach people to do so they do that? Just talk to the client or do you have them look reviews on different sites or forums yep. or you know? There's all kinds of things. So I ask a lot of questions to my clients. You know, I, I talk about, I ask a lot of questions from them. One of the things that I will ask them that usually works really well when someone can't get out of consultant speak is I will tell them if your client is laying in bed at night and they're staring at the ceiling, they can't sleep and they're thinking about this problem and they just can't sleep anymore. It's driving them crazy. They're thinking about it and they roll over and they shake their spouse and they say what to them. What is it that they're saying to them? How are they talking? Mm. I can't sleep. If I don't figure out how to do this, blah, 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 blah. You know, whatever it is that they're saying that that's, I can't sleep at night because I'm thinking about this. What are they right. saying to themselves? Right. And I had like a client the other day who had done a landing page and I forget what industry she was in, but it said how to do da, 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 da and feel luscious in your skin. <laughs> and I said, feel luscious in your skin. And she's like, yeah. And I go, are your clients laying in bed at night going, I really feel I could, I wish I could feel luscious in my skin. <laughs> I go, nobody's saying It sounds that ridiculous stuff. when you say that, right? Right. Nobody's saying, I wish I could feel luscious in my skin. Um, but when we're writing copy and we're really close to something and we're just trying to create something that stands out and sounds different, we can tend to get a little crazy. Right. And, and so that's the very best exercise. And then test it. If you write the copy and you say something out loud and you're like, is anybody walking around in their head going, I wish I could do, I could blah. And like, if they're not saying that to themselves, it's not copy you should use. Right. So there's two other things I want to talk about because I know we're right at the top of the hour. And um, one thing is people, the, it all goes back to which you are, have a high level of genius at is targeting, right? Mm -hmm. All of this is irrelevant. Everything's relevant if you don't have the right target and the person in the page because 
that's all of this is not going to to resonate with someone. What are some do's and don'ts about targeting? I know you have a lot of opinions uh, on this. Well, I can tell you the number one most important thing is that you need to target the problem and not the person. Mm -hmm. My example for that is, uh, there, I can give two examples. So one is, let's say you're in the weight loss space and you're trying to target people who want to lose weight. And you think, well, um, people who shop at Lane Bryant you know, they, that's a plus sized clothing store. So if you shop at Lane Bryant, you must be overweight, right? Well, is everybody who shops at Lane Bryant r trying to lose weight right now? Are they looking for a solution right now? No, yeah. not necessarily, right? Some of them might be perfectly happy with the size that they're at and they're not interested in losing weight. And so that's the mistake that people will make in targeting the person. You're targeting Lane Bryant, you're targeting a person. But if I target Weight Watchers or yeah. Jenny Craig, the average person in America is not following Weight Watchers or Jenny Craig if they're not interested in losing weight. Right. That's just not one of those things that you follow, right? right? Or a mistake that people will make is like, oh, I'll target the show The Biggest Loser. Because, you know, if you're over, there's a people losing weight and so people who are overweight might watch that show. Well, I watch that show. I love watching that show. And so that's another mistake where you're targeting the person instead of targeting the problem. You're not following Weight Watchers if you're not trying to lose weight. And, and so it's very important um, to be looking at that. And same thing is like, for instance, if you're uh, in business stuff, if you're in, in B2B or B2C, uh, or B2B, I mean, um, you have to, again, think about who are my prospects following that already solve this problem? Who has already captured an audience for me right that they're there because they have that problem and that person specializes in that because then you can target that person and take advantage of the audience that they've created by targeting them on Facebook. Mm -hmm. and, and so you wanna be thinking about um, experts, organizations, publications, groups, Facebook pages, anything like that where people, your people who have that problem are congregating there because they all have that problem. Right, I love that. Um, you know, Adrian, for you, a big part of your life is Facebook and, and also a big part of your life is, is hockey, right? Mm -hmm. um, so my last question talks about hockey. You know, your son is very talented at hockey and, and uh, you're a hardcore hockey mom. Mm -hmm. And um, he obviously trains his body, yeah. you know, but I know we've discussed before how important mindset is, mm -hmm. right, in this. Yeah. So how do you, how are you having him work on his mindset? How does he work on his mindset uh, as far as, I mean, cause this goes, obviously translates into business and life. Yeah. So I'm curious on, uh, he's playing at a very high level. Mm -hmm. um, what do you have him do to get his mindset right? It's really challenging, honestly, to do. I mean, he's 11 years old. And, yeah. and so trying to teach mindset to an 11 year old, they don't quite get what that actually means. Um, and so again, you use language that means something to them as an 11 year old. <laughs> and the thing that I try to get him, the, the number one thing I'm trying to do with him now, and I've really just started working with him on mindset probably in the last six to 12 months. Prior to that, I wasn't even thinking about it. We would just like get better at hockey, right? So now that he's better at hockey, now it's like, well, how do we take you to another yeah. level? And that is by controlling yeah. your mind. Because this is the same thing in business, right? I mean, yeah. Facebook ads, right? You were just honing your craft. Yep. And then you had there were mindset shifts you had to make to go from oh. 400 to 1,000 to 5,000 to 5,000 and whatever percentage. So right. I feel like it's the same same thing. It is. It is. You you At some point in time in your business or life, you're working on honing your skill. And then the thing that gets you to the next level isn't necessarily more skill. It, like you said, it's a change in mindset. And then that happens at multiple levels as you grow. It's not a one and done thing. Okay. And the main thing that I'm trying to focus on with him are, are two things is that, it, well, it, it all falls down to one thing. And that is focus on what he wants, not on what he doesn't want. Hmm. So he'll go into, you know, oh, I should have passed or I, w I, I didn't do this or I missed my shot or I did. And I, so then I try to bring it back and focus on what went right. So when he's going into the negative, I try to focus right. on what he did right and remind him, you know, well, you know, or he'll, he had a game where he was playing a bunch of kids that were much bigger than him yeah. and he was scared to death. Yeah. I remember this because yeah. you gave him a pep talk. And yeah. I said to him, I said, you are a very fast skater. Those boys that are really big, they're big, but they're slow. 
So although they, if they hit you, it's going to hurt a little bit more than usual, but you can avoid getting hit by keeping your head up and by being fast. You know you're fast, right? So I tried to get him to focus on the skill that he had that would help him in that situation instead of him focusing on like, oh my goodness, these kids are huge and they're going to kill me. And, and so I kept trying to remind him, you know, that you have a skill. One of your bit greatest skills is that you're fast. So use that skill when you're out there on the ice to dodge these guys and move around them quickly so that they can't hit you. And, and so I'm always trying to get him to remember the skills that he has and remind him of those when he goes into the negative and then also focus on what he wants. So rather than going into the game and saying, well, this is going to be a really hard game. You know, I don't know if we're going to be able to beat this team. I go, no, 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 no. Let's say I'm going to show up and I'm going to give it my all and we're going to beat this team. And I try to get him to focus on the outcome that he wants to have instead of what he's afraid of. Mm-hmm. And and it's really, really basic. And honestly, for most people listening, that might they might be like, duh. Like, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, often so the, the, it's often the fundamental things that we know that we don't practice. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, and so the other thing that I've been doing with him uh, for the past couple months, and again, we're start, we're talking about mindset for an 11-year-old, so it's very basic, but the other thing I've started with him a few months ago is I have him every morning before he goes to school, I have him writing down three things that he's grateful for. Hmm. I also have him write down one thing, just one thing that he wor- wants to work on improving, not like, hey, there's 10 things I suck at that I need to work on. I pick one thing you want to improve. And then I also have him write down one thing that he has improved on. So maybe something in the past you said, well, I want to get better at my, you know, slap shot. And then, you know, maybe a couple months later, his thing is, you know, I've improved my slap shot. So I have him write down three things I'm grateful for, because when you write, you can't be grateful and miserable at the same time. (laughs) You can't be grateful and unhappy at the same time. So I always try to get them to focus on what they're grateful for. And then write down one thing you want to improve on and one thing that you have improved on. Yeah. And it's working well. It's really helping him. If that doesn't apply to everyone, I don't know what does. <laughs> Andrea. So thanks for sharing that. That's awesome. Sure. I just want to be the first one to thank you. This has been awesome. Where should we point people towards so they can find out more about what you're working on? Well, they can just go to my website, which is adrianrichardson.com. Uh, on head over there, I've got a free um, scorecard there. If you are running ads, it will help you score your ad in five different areas, tell you what you're doing wrong and how to fix it. Um, so that's that's yeah. the best thing I can offer them. Adrian Richardson, A D R E N N E Richardson. We will link it up. Adrian, you rock. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire. Came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred.